What is this place? 700 years ago, a monk who defied the teachings was sentenced here. Oh, the traitor Omega, yeah? Omega's loathing of Yevon has turned him into a fiend. They say he liked it underground, out of the light. So, he's here? Scared? Not a chance. With the main story out of the way, Sin conquered, and all seven celestial weapons in our hands, it's time to take on the optional dungeon in Final Fantasy X. The fiends living in the Omega Ruins have some serious energy compared to the rest of Spira. From the Master Tonberry's Karma and the Great Marvel's Bad Breath to the Final Fantasy Classics of the Ultima and Omega Weapons. Thank you for joining me today as we explore all of those juicy loot locations, the many dangerous encounters, and the tactics you'll want to give you an edge against your first of many optional bosses, the Omega Weapon. First things first, to travel to the Omega Ruins, you'll have to find it. You can locate the ruins in the search option on the Airship Overworld map at the coordinates on the screen now, X72 and Y35. So let's get this straight. If you haven't gotten a game over screen yet, <laughs> let me tell you, some of these guys will really mess you up. And if they aren't bending you over the table, they're hitting you with high percentage status ailments that's gonna leave suspicious Walker <laughs> slapping his balls on your chin over and over and over again. Seriously though, these guys don't mess around. They are the strongest fiends you'll encounter naturally in the game, and some of them play pretty dirty. Looking at you, Great Marlboro. A weapon with the first strike ability is crucial here. You can customize that onto a weapon with one return spear, and on a casual playthrough, you should have a couple of these already if you haven't used them. If not, Barbaros has a 1 in 8 chance to drop them inside Sin. Or, I would recommend fully empowering Arn's Masamune to also get the weapon ability if you haven't done that already. A link to a guide for his weapon is in the top right corner if you need it. Taking this route, if you are planning on 100% completion, you should go ahead and collect 10 of every creature up to this point. Of course, you can always find a no encounters weapon to bypass a lot of the battles here, but that won't help make your boss fights any easier. Regardless, let's talk about those dangerous encounters. First up, you have the Master Curl, 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 Curl. You have the Master Curl and Floating Death. It doesn't look like much on paper with these three, but the Master Curl is scary because of its blaster move. An instant death attack that ignores even the death proof armor ability. Floating Death's single target attacks have a high chance of causing confusion. Next, we have the Black Elements and a Spirit. The Black Elements can hit hard, but the scary part is their ability to cast Berserk. A Berserk character does more damage, but can only attack creatures, meaning you're out of control of them unless you can remove that ailment. The Spirit when attacked has a chance of releasing a Poison Mist, similar to the fungi that we fought in Mushroom Rock Road and the cavern below the calm lands. This poison mist will cause confusion and poison. Confusion, poison, and berserk paired together could quickly lead to a game over screen. Next, we have two demonoliths. Now, these guys respond to every interaction a character has with them with Pharaoh's curse, causing a bunch of status ailments. On top of that, Stone Breath can be a quick game over screen for your party. It's important to get stoneproof armor or a first strike weapon. Valfor is actually considered out of range for their melee attacks and is immune to everything but curse as an Aeon, making her a viable strategy in this scenario. Next, <sighs> next we have Great Marlboro. So this ugly mug has caused more game overs than I can remember. Even when all the other fiends in this area become a walk in the park, Great Marlboro is there to remind you that you can beat a lot of things, but you can't beat luck. This dude has a 100% chance to ambush you in every fight, and its opening move is Bad Breath. It is guaranteed to inflict darkness, silence, and poison, as well as a high chance to cause confusion, slow, and berserk. Not having first strike when a battle starts with this guy could restart hours of grinding. You will easily watch your team either try to hit him and miss 
and kill themselves based off of poison, or attack each other until the game ends regardless. All you can do is sit there and watch if you aren't ready for this. However, when it comes to Aeons, Ifrit is your go-to here. The Great Marlboro is extremely vulnerable to fire damage. Remember that little guy with the lantern and Yojimbo's cavern? Well, his big brother is here for payback and he means business. With a whopping 48,000 health and a karma ability that does 10 times stronger damage than its little brother, you can't just mash attacks until it dies. At this point in the game, most of your characters have probably killed a lot of enemies. So its karma ability will most likely do over 10,000 damage and one-shot your entire team. However, it can only target one person at a time. So, you can take the time to heal any team member that goes down, and just keep trading blows with it. And finally, we have Mimics. The Omega Ruins like Beaconel and the Moonflow is no stranger to having chests in a battle, but there's a twist that comes with these. If you steal from a chest and receive nothing from it, it's going to turn into a Mimic. And those Mimics can take one of four shapes. They'll possibly reanimate a Machina, a Rock, a Basilisk, or a ruminant. Each of these four sprites have very different stats. The ruminant version is just simple to defeat all around. The Machina has high defense and is easier to eliminate with Demi, Doom, or Orange Shooting Star, while the rock version is more susceptible to magic. The final form is that of a Basculus, with opposite defense to the rock, so casting haste to go on your heavy hitters will make it go down quickly. Although challenging to deal with, Mimics are a great source of gill at this stage in the game, especially if you have Riku's God Hand fully maxed out. There's a guide on the top right to this if you haven't done that already too. So that was a lot, right? I'm sure you wrote all of that down. No? Here's a quick little bullet point to keep track of. Always have a first strike weapon in your party. Give someone stone proof. Riku is a good choice here because she can easily use Albed potions. Give somebody confuse proof. Preferably a heavy hitter like Waka or Orn. And finally, don't shy away from using Aeons. So now we have an idea of how to handle all these dangerous encounters. You'll realize as you've been walking around that the map is blank. Just like inside Sin, the map has a fog of war like state. It will slowly fill in as we travel through it. To make it a little easier, you can pause the video with this overlay on screen. But there will also be a map link below if you like that too. Some things to note on this map are, you can get a teleport sphere by activating the two glyphs on the map. The first glyph you come across will be inactive to start, but once you activate the glyph further in, the original will wake up and allow you to interact with that as well. Once both are activated, you can finally follow that snake's path behind you to open the chest. The final Albed Primer is located deep inside the ruins. As long as you haven't opened any chests, these four chests will be the indicator that you're in the right room and it will be under the dimly lit pedestal on the left. If you didn't notice, the Omega Ruins is a very dark place. The book can be easy to miss if you aren't paying attention. If you need help with the other primers, well, you guessed it. We have another link in the top right corner if you need that. Now, moving on to the second layer of the ruins, we'll prop the first boss fight, Ultima Weapon. If you spent some time leveling up against the fiends here, this guy is going to be a breeze. To get to him, you'll have to use a platform that'll raise up on the top right of the map. He comes in with just under 100,000 health and a planned set of moves. It will come in handy to have protection from confusion and silence to get through this boss fight. While Ultima Weapon may be an easier boss fight to handle, it is still very possible to die here. You're kidding! On his first turn, he uses a physical attack. Turn two, it could cast either confusion, silence, or break. On the third turn, it will cast a magical attack called Core Energy, which could do anywhere between 3,000 to 9,000 damage. On the fourth turn, it returns to spell casting with Confused Sleep or Holy, and Holy can do a whole crap ton of damage. On its fifth turn is another physical attack, and on its sixth turn, it uses a move called Shimmering Rain, an AoE that will do anywhere between 2,000 to 3,000 damage to the party. Ultima Weapon can only be affected by silence status-wise. Using Shell will limit the damage from its two strongest attacks, Holy and Core Energy. Surprisingly, it is vulnerable to Doom if you don't think you can finish it off within the first five- 
uh, 99 turns. Uh, but I, <laughs> I have faith in you. Otherwise, using haste to go with a combination of quick hit and or double casting should be ideal. One bizarre note about Ultima Weapon is that he doesn't feel like his boss Omega pays him enough. If you bribe this underpaid bodyguard 2 million gil to look the other way, he'll do it, no questions asked. And he'll even leave you up to 99 pendulums. These are used to upgrade a weapon with the Master Thief ability, and it's one of the easiest ways to do it. Master Thief allows you to steal some of the more rare items of a fiend more easily. If Ultima Weapon doesn't take the bribe right away, after you've offered him that 2 million, just keep offering him 1 gil each time until you finally get a success. Once you've met that overall threshold, using 1 gil or another 2 million gil just yield the same success rate. As a final note, make sure to steal those Doors of Tomorrow. They grant the overdrive converted to AP customization on the weapons and are crucial for a fast level grind in the monster arena. As we descend to the next layer of the ruins, you'll find two paths you can take, left and right. Heading left, you'll be rewarded with a friend spear after two encounters. Heading right will continue on your track to the Omega weapon. You notice that encounters are taking place whenever you step onto a new platform, regardless of no encounter weapons. The parties you encounter are a little different, but you'll still need to watch out for those fiends we mentioned before. Once you reach the glowing wall at the end of the road, it's time to take on Omega. It seems we rate his personal attention now. This guy packs a wall, and with just under 1 million HP, is tanky enough to stay around for a while. If you haven't collected the Celestial Weapons, I implore that you do so. He has a lot of similar moves to Ultima Weapon, like Core Energy and Shimmering Rain, as well as Demian Ultima added to its arsenal. However, as the fight goes on, there's a chance he'll use his ultimate attack, Nova, and it could do well over 7,000 damage and wipe your entire party. He doesn't fight quite as scripted as Ultima, however, so you can't easily predict what he'll do. All of his abilities do more damage than his counterpart, so strategically, starting the fight off with Hastiga, Shell, and Protect is ideal. Kamari's Mighty Guard, or Riku's Mix for Super or Hyper Mighty G, will help push it along even quicker in the early stages. If you want to try your luck with Yojimbo's Zanmato, like all other enemies in the game, he can be defeated this way. While we're here, stealing from Omega yields an easy 30 Gambler Spirits, and is one of two enemies in the game that Kamari can learn Nova from, his strongest overdrive. Your best start is going to be Kamari and Titus, followed by your highest damage dealer. Titus will likely have the first move, use him to cast haste go. When Kamari goes, he'll be able to use his mighty guard overdrive. And on his next turn, you can have him use Lancet to refill his overdrive gauge completely, using Nova on his third turn. After that, make sure you keep the pressure up. Use all your overdrives. Be wary of using any elemental spells or elemental attacks as he'll absorb them. If you're gonna use spells, you should be using Demi, Flare, or Holy, and continue to keep your party topped off where you can. His ability Nova is on a pseudo timer. The more often it acts, the more likely it is to use Nova. The basic premise is that it has a hidden counter that increases by five when it uses a normal attack, and by two when it uses any other ability. When that counter reaches 30, it will then attack with Nova. You can try to time the ability and summon an Aeon before you think it will use it. Otherwise, you'll just need to hope that your tankiest members will survive and quickly revive your fallen comrades. Omega Weapon drops level 4 key spheres and a chest containing a magic sphere will spawn in the back of his chamber. As the fight ends, Orin turns out to be a little bit of a hypocrite and then the party returns to the entrance of the ruins. Everybody, I hope this guide has helped. Omega is one of many optional bosses in Final Fantasy X, and a great one to start with. He introduces a few mechanics that you'll end up using against even the Dark Aeons, and he gives you a little taste of how strong the bosses can be. If Omega is a little bit too much to handle, just grind out even more while you're in the dungeon. Keep at it, and you'll eventually be able to get him. If you defeat him with ease, your party could even be ready to take on Dark Valfour next. If you'd like some help with that, subscribe to the channel and turn on that notification. We'll be uploading that boss fight here soon. As always, thanks for sticking around until the end, and I'll catch you all in the next video.
But we'll also look not but uh, sorry I got a burp drum. I almost threw up in my mouth. 